I'm Damian Barling, and welcome into the latest edition of Be Conscious. I can't thank you enough for downloading this episode. If you're a subscriber, can't thank you enough for subscribing. And if you're not, what are you waiting for? If you found us on iTunes, Google Play, whatever it may be, uh, go hit the subscribe button. Never miss a single episode of the show. And if you think we're worth it, uh, hit the five-star review. We'd greatly appreciate that. That helps us get noticed in the various podcast platforms as this thing is still brand new and it's still growing. And if this is your first episode, when we wrap up today, go back and dig in the archives. We've got some really good ones, which I'm going to reference uh, a number of times today as today's episode is going to be just a little bit different than the seven that we've done in the past, uh, mainly because it's just me. I'm riding solo today. I don't have a guest. Uh, I have a. I, I had a clear idea last week where I wanted to go with this week's podcast, and I'll give you the whole the whole groundwork for uh, why I'm solo today, and and what the focus of uh, today's conversation is going to be. Uh, but I did want to let you know again, if you're new to the show, uh, you can connect with us. D Barling at SACLocalMedia.com. That's D B A R L I N G at SACLocalMedia.com. You can connect with me on any social media network that you would like, whether it is Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Uh, just search Damien Barling. That's my name. You'll be able to find me uh, that way. Um, last week, uh, Ested Herndon joined us, Ested Herndon of the New York Times, and we spent a lot of time talking about. Uh, Donald Trump, Helsinki, November uh, 2020, some uh, different uh, current event political issues. But we opened up with uh, the reopening of the Emmett Till case and how we both felt about that. And leading into our conversation with the Stead Herndon, I had told you about a book that I read called The Blood of Emmett Till. And... I, it's a it's a it's a quick read. You're able to get through it pretty quick I, because of this podcast. And just the nature of life for me, audiobooks are a little bit easier now than than reading actual physical books. So I, especially since the start of this podcast, I have started to listen to a ton of books. And The Blood of Emmett Till, I was able to get through uh, in like a day and a half. I think it's barely eight hours long. It's a little bit over eight hours long. But it really is an incredible, uh, it's an incredible read. It's an incredible listen. And it does a fantastic job of not only detailing the murder of Emmett Till, which is saved for the final few pages and is absolutely brutal and should be should be approached with caution if you decide to read or listen to that book. Be aware of the final few minutes. Be aware of the final few pages because it really is tough to listen to. Uh, in the case of the audio book, obviously, it was, it was tough to listen to and it can bring you to tears listening to the description of Emmett Till's murder. But what that book does is it gives you a background on Emmett Till, uh, gives you a background on Carolyn Bryant, who's the one who's been in the news lately, and it gives you a background on 1955 Mississippi uh, and what racial interactions were like then. And... My overwhelming feeling listening to that book was, you know, Emmett Till happened just before Rosa Parks and the Montgomery bus boycott, and thus what is credited as the birth, I guess, of the civil rights movement. And my first thought when that book was done, because it had been running through my head the entire read, was Trayvon Martin. And I couldn't stop thinking about Trayvon Martin for that entire book. And Trayvon Martin, I'm sure if you're listening to a podcast called Be Conscious, I'm sure you're pretty aware of who and what Trayvon Martin is. I, I don't think I have to detail the, the, uh, the timeline for you as to who Trayvon Martin is and his murder and all of that. But what I would like to provide you is a uh, a relation to Emmett Till. As we just said a second ago, Emmett Till, Rosa Parks, the explosion of the civil rights movement. And as I said, I kept thinking about Trayvon Martin and Trayvon Martin's murder, George Zimmerman's acquittal. The initial post from Alicia Garza was the day 
George Zimmerman was acquitted, which was five years ago this this month. And essentially, five years ago this month was the birth of the Black Lives Matter movement. When George Zimmerman was acquitted, Alicia Garza wrote a, a long and passionate post that ultimately ended with, I love us, I love black people, black lives matter, keep it moving. And her friend uh, shared it, and she was the first person to use the hashtag, Black Lives Matter. And it lived, and it simmered, and it was around. Then Michael Brown was murdered in Ferguson. And it was there, in Ferguson, that the Black Lives Matter movement exploded. And if you want more context to the Black Lives Matter movement, I talked to Wesley Lowry of the Washington Post, who was there on the ground in Ferguson um, when Black Lives Matter became what we know it as today. And his perspective on that is is really extraordinary. As a matter of fact, he has a book called They Can't Kill Us All. Uh, again, and that's going to be a, a point throughout the life of this podcast. A lot of the conversations are with authors, uh, journalists, reporters. I'm going to reference uh, their work and various books that I think you should go check out. And They Can't Kill Us All is another fantastic book. If you haven't listened to our conversation with Wesley Lowry, you can head back in the archives. It's episode number two, and it really is one of my favorite episodes. I just feel bad because I think I shortchanged us in that. I could have talked with Wesley for probably another 20 to 30 minutes just about his book alone and about what he experienced in Ferguson. Uh, if you really want to Google, if you really want to find out more about Wesley Lowry, Google Wesley Lowry and McDonald's. You might not remember that name, but when you see the story of journalists getting thrown out, arrested at a McDonald's, he's one of them. So, you look at Emmett Till and Rosa Parks and the civil rights movement. I look at Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, and the explosion of Black Lives Matter. And that's where we are today. And Trayvon Martin certainly wasn't the first innocent black teenager to be murdered. But there was something about him that really, really stood out. And... Part of it was President Obama. President Obama mentioned Trayvon Martin by name on several different occasions. And had George W. Bush been in office, uh, had virtually any other president in history have been in office, they wouldn't have been able to use the words that President Obama used. President Obama stood on a podium in front of the world and said, I could have been Trayvon Martin. No one else could say that. No other president in history could say that. My kids could have been Trayvon Martin. Again, no other president in history could have said that. I think that's one of the reasons it resonated so deeply. Because we had a president for the first time being able to relate to something like this and being able to speak on it on a world stage. Now, it's one thing for reporters to talk about it. It's one thing. You know, this is a story in Sanford, Florida, it's you know you've got the Orlando Sentinel and the Miami Herald, and you know how the news cycle is now. It could be a hot story for what three days, a week, maybe, and then it comes back in the trial. But I think because President Obama addressed it, it rang a little bit more. Now, no matter no matter how you felt about Trayvon Martin, no matter how you felt about the story, with evidence or otherwise, and you you know that's. The way people are now, the evidence doesn't really matter. We're going to take sides and we're going to take sides immediately because of social media. We have to have a take on what's happening. It it happens over and over and over again now. It's very prominent in 2018. You have to have an opinion on something, evidence be damned, right away. And I don't think it was that different in 2012 when Trayvon Martin was murdered. But you had President Obama talking. Then you got other people talking about it. Then you had the Miami Heat when LeBron James was there, and it was LeBron and and D. Wade and and Chris Bosh. And you had those guys uh, do the the photo shoot with the Miami Heat uh, sweatshirts on. 
The hoodie's pulled over their head. They're all looking down. You really can't decipher one from the other. You can't tell who is who. They're all just kind of blended in together, and you see guys with hoodies, and that goes up on their social media accounts. It goes up on the Miami Heat social media account, and it spreads all across. Is LeBron James' first real dip into activism. And it was the verdict, it was the trial of George Zimmerman and the not guilty verdict that led to Alicia Garza's post in Black Lives Matter. And then it was the murder of Michael Brown in Ferguson at the hands of Officer Darren Wilson that led to the explosion of Black Lives Matter. And now coming up on July 30th, which is why I really wanted to focus this week's show on Trayvon Martin is a mini series starts on BET on the July 30th called rest in power. And it's the, the full story on Trayvon Martin and the trailer, the trailer is brutal to watch, you know, and, and I think one of the taglines to the show is uh, they say time heals all wounds, but it doesn't heal this one. And the first sound that you hear on the trailer is Trayvon Martin's dad calling 911, saying that he's missing. And again, it is brutal to watch. And it's going to be a difficult series to watch for some of us. But I'm very much looking forward to it, and it's why I wanted to focus today's conversation on Trayvon Martin and the impact that I think he's going to have on this country and civil rights moving forward. Now, I know when you say the term civil rights, you immediately think back to the 50s and the 60s, and you think that we're long past that. And to a certain degree, we are. I mean, we're, we're past, for the most part, openly using the N-word when referring to Black people. And I say for the most part because we all know that that's very much not true. You could do a quick internet search and probably find a video that was taken an hour ago. There's a video that just went up right now. I don't even remember what town this was in, but the driver uh, who rolls down his window and starts screaming the N-word at the, at the dude who's recording him. And I feel so stupid saying the N-word. I, I feel like that just that just minimizes on every aspect the power of the word. Like uh, um, Karan Phillips used it uh, with us when when he talked the other day, when we talked with him a couple weeks ago, excuse me. And there is a certain jolting power when you use that word. But I'm trying to a certain degree be respectful for the company that has given me the platform for this podcast. Because if I had my way, and to a certain degree I do, but I would use that word in its form that relates to the conversation. And in the form that it relates to the conversation today is the ER version. And, you know, you have the, uh, for sports fans, and I know a lot of people who are listening to this listen to uh, the sports radio show I do in Northern California every day. Very appreciative. You know, we've had conversations about uh, Josh Hader, the pitcher in Houston, or excuse me, the pitcher in Milwaukee, who tweeted white power and KKK and used uh, the hard ER version of the N-word on his Twitter account when he was 17. And I had never seen so many people quick to jump to the defense of a person saying, well, he was 17 years old. I mean, gosh, he was he was just a baby like he he's a kid. He, he, He didn't know any better. Javon Martin was 17 when he was murdered. 17. So Josh Hader was a kid who said in front of the media that night of the All-Star game when those uh, tweets had been made public, oh, I, I was just tweeting what was on my mind. Really? KKK, white power. That's what, that's what was on your mind. Okay. And I'm supposed to believe in the last seven years that you grew out of that. And I watched baseball media people I listen to national sports media people, people, some I have a tremendous amount of respect for. I watched the fans in Milwaukee give him a standing ovation when he returned a few days later. 
Shouldn't be surprising given the things that I've heard and read about my uh, Milwaukee. Excuse me. Fans gave him a, a, a standing ovation when he returned in Milwaukee. Which it, again, shouldn't, shouldn't surprise you. Doesn't surprise me. You could do a little bit more research on, on Milwaukee and find out why none of that is shocking at all. But you hear these people defend him. He was 17. It was seven years ago. How dare someone dig through his uh, uh, Twitter account from seven years ago and pull up these tweets in his big moment in the All-Star game? Again, the, the, the focus shifted from the person who had committed the act to essentially the whistleblower. And you know who had to fix it? Non-sports fans will help you out here. Lorenzo Cain had to fix it. If you don't know who Lorenzo Cain is, he's also a Milwaukee Brewer. He was also an all-star. And he was black. (laughs) He is black. He had to fix it. Because the media ran to him. Because you can't run to a white teammate and ask them what they think about Josh Hader's racist, racist text messages or racist tweets. You have to go ask his black teammate. And what did Lorenzo Cain do? He does what black athletes have done for generations, dating all the way back to Jackie Robinson. He bailed his ass out. He said he was a great teammate, said he was uh, a, a great guy. He has a tremendous relationship. We'll all get this, through this together. So again, white person commits an act of racism. White person exposes their racism. Black person has to fix it. There's a, a player at um, uh, a college football player at Michigan State was thrown off the team because he had a, a, a text message was made public about him uh, uh, calling one of his teammates uh, again. Guess who's back on the team today? Why? We'll read the article. He apologized to his teammates, specifically his African American teammates. So the burden again falls on the African American. This time, it's not an African. In 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 a, in a much similar way, it is a it is the victim, right? If if you want to say uh, using that word is a crime, then the victim would be the black people it was directed at, or perhaps black people in general. Who has to accept it? especially in athletics. And again, this isn't new. It goes back to Jackie Robinson. It goes back to it, it goes back as far as you want to remember. Most famous recent example at least in my eyes is Riley Cooper. Riley Cooper went full on American History X at a country music concert on video. He was a member of the Philadelphia Eagles at the time. Who was his quarterback? Michael Vick. Michael Vick had just reemerged. He was he was recrafting his whole image. What did he do? The very next time they were seen together. Very next time they had practice. Michael Vick, black quarterback, threw his arm around the racist wide receiver and walked out there together. Said exactly the same thing Lorenzo Cain said just a couple of days ago. We're going to get through this. So while the civil rights movement uh, may have passed, you could argue whether it was successful or not. In many ways, it very, very much was. And you're seeing some of that work trying to be undone in 2018, but we'll save that for a different episode because that's far too much to talk about here today. There is a movement within this Black Lives Matter group that can't be ignored. Because just as the civil rights movement did, just as the civil rights movement made people uncomfortable, that's what the Black Lives Matter movement is doing. See, Black Lives Matter has now been shaped as a terrorist organization, which ranks up there with some of the most absurd things I've ever seen. Black Lives Matter has created, um, uh, I almost want to call them uh, parody versions, because now you got to have all lives matter. Now you got to have. Blue Lives Matter, which alone right there, just as it stands alone, like think about this for me. 
if you're okay with the term blue lives matter, good for you. If you're okay with the term all lives matter, good for you. Now, I realize, again, if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably not. But if you're okay with all lives matter and you're okay with blue lives matter, that leads me to believe your only issue is black. Because it's the only difference, right? It's Black Lives Matter. When we have Breast Health Awareness Month, are are the are the uh, I don't know prostate cancer guys mad? Yo, all cancers matter. Is is that a thing? Do other fo- the lung cancer people are pissed when breast cancer awareness gets here? Is that it? I've never, ever heard anyone say it should be all cancer awareness. Never heard that. But every, what is it, October? September, October? We have Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And that's fantastic. We should have it. But but do you get the correlation there? People are scared, specifically, white people are scared of Black Lives Matter. Why? Why? Because it's grown in power. It's gotten attention. It has a voice. Go back and listen to our conversation. The very first episode of Be Conscious we ever did. With Howard Bryant. Writer of a book called The Heritage. Where he talks in depth about the history of black athletes protesting. And... One of the questions I asked him was, and I do believe, and, and I I'm, I'm, I'm think I'm going to feel this way for a long time, as we aired that interview for the first time in its entirety on my radio show just a couple of days ago. I think that's the best interview I've ever done, and that has very little to do with me and a whole lot to do with Howard Bryant. And one of the things that I asked him was, we look back, society looks back at Muhammad Ali differently than they did in the 60s and 70s. Look back on uh, Tommy Smith and John Carlos differently than they did in the 60s and 70s. Hell, we even look at Martin Luther King differently today than they did in the 60s and 70s. Why? And his answer was brilliant. And you should go back and listen to it It's in, in, in its entirety. But it was simply because they've proven to be on the right side of history. The narrative changes once you're proven you're right. Muhammad Ali wasn't going to go to war. Muhammad Ali wasn't going to go to war that black people were against and many white people were against. But once that war turned into what it was, oh man, Muhammad Ali was looked at differently. But then his voice started to disappear. Like literally started to disappear. He got sick. And Howard's most underlying point was, well, the main reason is it's because they're dead. They're no longer a threat. But the biggest is, uh, or the second biggest is, that they're, they're, they were proven to be on the right side of history. I will maintain this until I'm proven wrong. That's what's going to happen with Colin Kaepernick. Colin Kaepernick is never going to play football again. And for what that means and the overall impact of what I believe is like the second version of a civil rights movement, it's going to be incredibly impactful and powerful. And his role in that is going to be more impactful and powerful because he will never, ever get to play again. Main reason, likely, Donald Trump. And the NFL owners continuing to bow down to Donald Trump. And so when we look back, I don't know, in 10 years, maybe that's too early, maybe 15, maybe 20 years, Colin Kaepernick is going to be looked at a whole lot differently than he is today. Athletes that protest or demonstrate are going to be looked at differently because they always are 20 years from now than they are today. Jackie Robinson is looked at differently. Jackie Robinson is... 
Jackie Robinson. Oh, he was so good. He he was he was the first black player they let into Major League Baseball. And he that's all he was. He was just the first black player that they let into Major League Baseball. There were there were incredible black players before him, but for some reason, Jackie Robinson was the one they decided to let in. And then when he retired, what happened? He wanted to be involved in in, in an organization. He wanted to be involved in in, in Major League Baseball. Did he get in? Nope. What'd he do? If y'all don't know, Jackie Robinson in retirement became significantly more radical in his approach to race relations than he was when he was a Major League Baseball player. Why? He wanted to play baseball. He didn't want to be blackballed the same way history has shown Tommy Smith was, John Carlos was, Colin Kaepernick was, and Eric Reed was. Excuse me, Colin Kaepernick is and Eric Reed is because they're still very much being blackballed as both of those guys can very much still play football. Eric Reed, I may be proven wrong on at some point. I don't think so. I might be. Colin Kaepernick, I won't be. But those guys that had just, the, the guys in the past, the Ali, even Dr. King, Martin Luther King wasn't, Martin Luther King's approval ratings were terrible back in the 60s. The FBI director, J. Edgar Hoover, told Martin Luther King to kill himself. We're going to expose you for a fraud. You know what you need to do. End this. Kill yourself. Move along. Hmm. Now we celebrate him every January. Why? Well, because he was proven to be on the right side of history. And that's what Trayvon Martin is going to be. And that's what Black Lives Matter is going to be. People are scared of Black Lives Matter because of the voice and the impact that it has today. And in a country being led by a guy who doesn't want anyone other than his group to have a voice or an impact, they're going to be minimized as much as possible or discredited. Because Black Lives Matter has gotten to the point where you can't minimize it. So you discredit it and you call it a terrorist organization. And every time a group of black people get together and protest, it's labeled as Black Lives Matter, which couldn't be further from the truth. Black Lives Matter is a group. It's a, a group of people that organize protest. Black Lives Matter is not every black person that goes out and decides to protest. They're very different things. I can give you a great example, as I know a lot of people who subscribe to this podcast and listen to this podcast are here in the city of Sacramento. And even if you don't, you're probably familiar with the with the protest that took place outside the Golden One Center in the last NBA season. That first protest, that first night in which Sacramento Kings owner Vivek Ranadive gave an impassioned speech about the Kings and our Sacramento community, that was an organized protest. What happened, was it four nights later? That wasn't an organized protest. Those were people who were frustrated about some things that were going on at city council and city hall and all that, and they just wanted to to cause ruckus. They just wanted to make Facebook videos and Instagram videos and be a part of a movement that they had no business being a part of. But you know what it was labeled as? And believe me, I know because I was here and I dealt with it. It was labeled as Black Lives Matter is out there disrupting You know, the Sacramento Kings basketball game. Far from the truth. Couldn't be further from the truth. But you try to discredit an organization that scares you. And Black Lives Matter scares people. Why? Because it's right. And in 10 years, when you look back at this organization and it's 15 years old, or it's 25 years old, or it's 50 years old, you're going to see that it was on the right side of history especially now in 2018 when you have you know the the uh, memory of Trayvon Martin still ringing strong and Mike Brown and Alston Sterling and and exa- you know Philandro Castro an example after example we got Stefan Clark here in Sacramento and we've got just one after the other after the other after the other and that list is going to continue to grow there's no denying it. Just when you think you're going to get past something, you don't. Something reemerges. 
So July 30th, Rest in Power, the Trayvon Martin story. Again, it's a book that you can check out, uh, but it's also a mini series on BET. I'm suggesting uh, that you check that out. I really appreciate you tuning in. I know today's episode was was completely different uh, than anything that we have done so far in the brief history of Be Conscious. I do hope you enjoyed it. I really did want to bring back the conversation that we had last week about Trayvon Martin and and how I think him and Emmett Till should be linked together in history. If you have some thoughts on this episode or any episode or future episodes that you want to share, uh, please reach out. I really do. And I read every single email. I try to respond to everybody uh, who reaches out, whether it's on Twitter, uh, Facebook, or Instagram. You can connect all those ways uh, at Damien Barling. Simple. Just search it in whatever your favorite uh, social media engine is or search it in all of them. Uh, I love connecting with everybody. Also, emails for uh, longer conversations, dbarling at saclocalmedia.com. You can connect with me there. If this is the first time you're listening, hit the subscribe button. If you think we're worth it, hit the five-star review. And if this is the first episode you've checked out, go back and dig in the archive. Some great stuff there. As we've mentioned, uh, Howard Bryant and Wesley Lowry in this conversation. Uh, we talked to Ested Herndon last week about the Helsinki Summit and Donald Trump and minority voters moving forward in November in 2020 and how that's going to influence uh, upcoming elections. So uh, Karan J. Phillips, another really good conversation. Uh, Dr. Robin D'Angelo, uh, the White Fragility episode has gotten a lot of great reviews there as well. I, I To be honest, of all the episodes we've done, that was the one I wasn't sure how people were going to react to. And her book, White Fragility, is fantastic. And I thought that conversation with her was fantastic as well. So go catch up on all the past episodes, and we will be back here next Thursday. Thank you so much for tuning in.